Superheroes are mass culture, but comic books are niche. Tens of millions of people saw Captain America Civil War, but this past May, Marvel only sold 177,000 copies of Civil War II. But if you took Marvel's opening credits and replaced this with this, even the people who'd never touched a comic book page would notice. Everybody knows the comic book font. How could there be a universally recognized font for something that for a half century was written by hand? Is it a font at all? How is that possible? These fonts are made by people called letterers, and their work shows how hundreds of lettering artists can come together into a single recognizable style, and how we, as consumers, then manage to get it completely wrong. If you go to a comic book store, you can see comics that were gloriously lettered by hand, like this 1964 issue of Thor. Yes, it was a Stan Lee and Jack Kirby production. And they worked with Artie Semek. Artie probably gave Thor this epic womb. Letterers place and draw expressive dialogue bubbles, like this one. But in Artie's day, they also hand wrote every word in a dialogue bubble and a lot of practical conditions shape the artistry of the letters. What I think of as comic book lettering is 1960s Marvel Comics. They were mainly lettered by two guys, uh, Artie Simic and Sam Rosen. For me, they kind of nailed it. That's John Rochelle, who founded Comic Craft, a comic book font company with Richard Starkings. They're letterers and writers, and they make fonts like this one and comics like this one. The fonts they design imitate a style that formed out of necessity. That style came out of the newspaper world and newspaper technology. Early comics like Little Nemo, which came out in the 1900s, started to develop a style that was readable on cheap paper. You can see it forming in this bubble. It's all caps like a comic book font, but it's somehow wrong. As time went on, that changed. Yeah, I think certainly early on, comic strips and comic books were lettered by the artist. And then as they gained popularity, that's when the production model started to get split up, just basically to meet the demand. A letterer was probably just somebody in the office who had good handwriting, who could, who could do it fast enough. But the form's limitations shaped the style that emerged across the industry. Most letterers used an Ames guide like this one to create their lines, which meant each letter hit the same height and more likely hit middle in the middle of the line. These letters became kind of squat because they're really trying to hit the lines on the top and bottom of the guide. That led to generally rounder O's and fatter A's with lower crosses. Earlier letterers also used a speedball nib pen or a technical pen. These things here, they're nibs. They determine the shape of a stroke and an artist could use any type of nib they wanted but a lot of the time they chose nibs that gave them a consistent stroke width. Compare this Loki to one that shows up in Times New Roman. Now look at the Times one. It has a skinny base on the L, a very narrow O at the top, and all sorts of other little details where the stroke width varies. Artie Simic's Loki, however, has a really consistent width to it. The quality of the pages also influenced the style that letterers chose. Here's that 1964 Thor next to Thor from 2016. Just look at the difference between the pages. Today's glossy Thor can handle all sorts of letters, but 1964's couldn't. Letterers wrote in all caps to compensate. Look at this ad from 1964's Thor. The ink is blotchy and hard to read. All caps helps fix that. And see how the tail on the Y and G forces the whole line to be longer? All caps help letterers fit more dialogue into less space and keep it clear on lousy paper. Other rules emerge too. Never cross an I unless it's by itself. Uh, always italicize and bold for emphasis. And all of them were made to make comics printed on bad paper easier to read. Consistency also mattered in case another letterer jumped in to finish a page or fix up a typo. And all those constraints and choices created the handwritten style that we recognize. But today to call it handwriting would be lying. 
Richard Starkeens, who runs Comicraft with John Rochelle, was frustrated with the work involved in lettering. This is The Killing Joke. It's a classic, controversial 80s comic that's been reprinted in deluxe editions. And Richard Starkings lettered it. Starkings had an experienced letterer's appreciation of detail, but he was so frustrated by the work involved. And an industry that knew the computers were the future, but wasn't willing to go there just yet. There'd been earlier attempts to standardize fonts in comics. Most famously, a publisher called EC Comics used a guide to trace every letter, and the result ended up looking kind of mechanical, like type. Other publishers played with type too, but Starkings and Rochelle led the charge into digital fonts. For a long time, we had things our way because there were a lot of technophobes in comics. There were a lot of people who didn't want to change. Those people have grown old and there are people in their 20s editing and designing comics now, and they expect you to have every font in our library and then some. Today, companies like Comicraft and competitors like Blambot make fonts that letterers can download and then work with in programs like Adobe Illustrator. They still make the bubbles and design the text. They just don't use ink to do it. But those companies don't just sell one comic book font. They sell a ton. And that's because the idea of a comic book font is a mistake in the first place. The general public only really became aware of fonts with the rise of personal computers. This chart shows the appearances of the word font in books from 1960 to 2000. We can see Helvetica and Arial and Futura because our computers have trained us to look for them. Some fonts came with our machines or condensed in the document cloud. We notice them. We see these tiny differences. There have always been hundreds of comic book fonts too, attuned to the idiosyncrasies of the artists who used to letter them. But most people, just like me, haven't been trained to see the nuance in their work. Comics fans and letterers do. That's a Todd Klein R. Different letterers have their letters of the alphabet that are kind of their signature. Dave Gibbons, his D and his G. His G is almost a six. It's a a real um, loop around on itself. Even Richard Starkings has a quirk a jagged hook on his S that always stands out. As technology allows for variety and ease of use, creativity continues to flourish even if handwriting gets digitized. Comics like Klaus can use color with abandon, and artsy comics like The Joiners are able to experiment with all kinds of fonts without worrying about cheap paper, reducing readability. The comic book font is a starting point, an idea we keep around because it shows the verve of comics. Within that style is the variety of different artists and designers expressing a key element in every story. And maybe even some of those superhero movie fans will notice it. So in addition to identifying a letterer by their handwriting, sometimes you can spot one by the style of their bubbles. John Workman is famous for creating word bubbles that jut right into the gutter of a page, and it creates a really distinctive style that's easy to spot. 